Well, good morning. God is good, isn't he? All the time. And all the time? God is good. Amen. We serve a good God. A few weeks ago, we started a series in the Sermon on the Mount. And this is actually the third message in the series. But the notes are from last week because I wanted to uh, add some stuff and filled in. So we don't, have, we don't have notes for today. I'm kind of a week behind. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but we have the notes from last week, which I want to cover because there were some things I wanted to share uh, last week and didn't get a chance. We, last week, we started to look at the Beatitudes and... Uh, I want to read that passage, but when I get to verse 3 and we have to hit the actual Beatitudes, I want to have a responsive reading uh, at that point where I would, I would say the first part of the Beatitude and then you out loud together would, would complete the, um, the Beatitude, all right? Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Amen. Everyone, everyone said, Amen. Amen to God's word. I mentioned last week that to. To understand the Sermon on the Mount in general and the Beatitudes in particular, we need to interpret the Beatitudes in the light of the context uh, that it's in. It's always important to understand the context in which something is said because a text out of context is a pretext. It's not, uh, you're not going to have an accurate understanding. So we, the context I mentioned is found in chapter 4, the context is that of a light that's dawning in Galilee, which speaks of the coming of a king and his kingdom. And in verse 17 of verse chapter 4, we find it summed up in these, these words, from that time, that is the imprisonment of John the Baptist, from that time, Jesus began to proclaim, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. From that time, why was that significant, that, that John the Baptist was imprisoned and would soon be executed? That was kind of a divine signal for Jesus that, that when he was in prison, Jesus withdrew into Galilee he began his public ministry. He moved from his hometown of Nazareth to Capernaum on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. And the reason why it's significant is because John the Baptist is the culmination of the Old Covenant. He's the greatest of the Old Covenant, yet the least, the, the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist who represented the Old Covenant. Uh, he said those words. Jesus said that he was the greatest of, of, of all men born of a woman, which speaks of natural birth. The, the greatest was John the Baptist, but the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist because he represented the new covenant. And his message was repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. It's within your reach. It's within your grasp. It's near. It's for the taking. 
Now, he doesn't, when he says repent for the kingdom of, of God is near, is at hand, he's not saying, now get your act together, straighten, straighten up and, uh, so you can qualify for the kingdom. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying the word repent means reconsider, change your thinking, change your mind. And so it's reconsider who is, in, is going to be invited to, the part, to participate in the kingdom of heaven. Change your mind about who uh, qualifies, who doesn't. For the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Those who outwardly appear the most righteous are in fact the farthest from the kingdom and those who seem far from the kingdom, far from God, are in actuality the ones who are close to the kingdom. Now to understand the Beatitudes, you need to realize it's not a list of requirements to get God to bless us. He's not saying these are the things that will qualify you for the kingdom of God. These are the things that I'm going to bless. It's not a list of attitudes and behaviors that we should emulate. He's not saying, I want you to be poor in spirit. Okay, I'll be poor in spirit. I'll just kind of, kind of look down and don't act meek. I'll be meek. Um, he's not saying be these things. He's saying, Blessed are the, those who are, in these, who are in these categories of the Beatitudes because they're invited to be part of his kingdom. It's not, in other words, not just a list of rules that we are to measure up to, but the Beatitudes are invitations to enter the kingdom of God, given to people who would never in a million years have dreamed that they would qualify to participate in the kingdom of God. The Beatitudes describe the type of people to whom the kingdom belongs and through whom the kingdom of God will flow. Jesus says the kingdom of God is not going to come to the rich and the powerful and the influential, but to the poor in spirit, to the oppressed, to the marginalized, to the powerless. The kingdom of God is not going to come to the respectable and the religious it's going to come to sinners and prostitutes and tax collectors and the morally bankrupt. And what I want to do is I want to include this, the Beatitudes, and, and kind of an expanded uh, version of that to give you a, a little greater idea of what the overall picture is all about. It's not so much the individual traits as the picture that you get, uh, the overall picture from the Beatitudes as a whole. So, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who recognize their spiritual poverty, for the kingdom of God is not a fellowship of the pious, the self-righteous, and the morally superior. It's a community of sinners and strugglers who are not interested in pointing fingers of accusation at others, but in ministering grace and love to others. Blessed are the more, those who mourn. Blessed are the brokenhearted, the deeply hurting, those whose dreams are shattered, whose hearts are heavy, whose hope is gone. Blessed are they, for they shall find comfort and strength and grace and hope in the kingdom of God. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the gentle spirited, the non grasping, the non assertive, the ones who sort of get pushed to the side and, um, and the more aggressive kind of just push them aside to get through. But he says, Blessed are the, the powerless, the marginalized, the oppressed, the exploited, for in the end, the gentle and the kind-hearted who entrust themselves to God will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who seek for a genuine righteousness of the heart and not simply the, the hypocrisy of parading our righteousness 
before others to impress them. Blessed are those who desire genuine heart and righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they are invited to enter a kingdom composed of people who know their own desperate need for mercy, and so they are willing to extend it to others. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. In a religious system where duplicity and deception are woven into the very fabric of everything that happens, he says, Blessed are those who in the simplicity and purity of the heart genuinely desire to see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, the peace bringers, the grace givers, who don't just pacify to avoid confrontation. They make peace. They bring reconciliation and genuine peace. And they, they, in that way, they reflect the nature and character of God, their Father. And blessed are the persecuted for righteousness' sake. Those who are persecuted for the sake of doing what is right. Because not everybody's going to appreciate kingdom-minded people who, who expose the poverty of self-righteousness and the hypocrisy of show-righteousness. They bring peace whenever possible, but they can't, never compromise the truth in doing so. So I said all that to summarize it this way. Jesus is saying, my kingdom is not going to come the way you think it's going to come. It's not going to come to the people you think it's going to come to. Jesus says, in my kingdom, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. The greatest shall be the least, and the least shall become the greatest. For in the kingdom of Christ, everything is turned upside down and inside out. There should be a warning, I think, on the teachings of Jesus, especially in the Sermon on the Mount. There ought to be a warning label that says the Surgeon General has determined that this message may be hazardous to your preconceived ideas about God. It may have the dangerous side effects, including outbursts of joy, sudden attacks of giddiness, an overwhelming sense of gratitude, and a newfound joy in serving Christ. So this should also be a warning that says Jesus is going to say things that are going to scandalize you, going to scandalize Christians as well as non-Christians. And Jesus did not disappoint. Now, E. Stanley Jones said there are two types of religion. This is the basis of the message this, this morning. Because the message is entitled, you don't have the, I just realized you don't have the title for this, today's message. The title is Meeting God at the Lowest Rung of the Ladder. Meeting God at the Lowest Rung of the Ladder. He says there are two types of religion. The one that tries to meet God in reconciliation at the top rung of a long ladder. Now, this is only a 12-foot ladder. Now, imagine it going 100 times that uh, and more. One type of religion tries to meet God at the top rung of the ladder. The other meets God at the lowest rung. One tries to climb up the ladder to God by good deeds, by striving, keep busy, more laws, earn it, do more, keep rules, try hard, try harder, try hardest, keep trying, keep doing. And the message of the gospel is that God meets us at the lowest rung of the ladder, the rung of grace. He knew that we could never climb up to him. We could never reach up to him. And we, we don't make it very far on this ladder of the law. So he came down to us. 
And the gospel says, makes God accessible to even the lowest sinner. But the, the gospel message scandalizes those who try to reach God at the top rung of the ladder through the law. The top rung of the ladder being keeping the rules, your morality, what the scripture simply calls the law. The, the religious leaders were scandalized because Jesus received sinners and actually ate with them. He met them on the, the lowest rung of the ladder because they were the lowliest in terms of keeping the rules and, and moral standing. You remember the story of the prodigal son. I want, I want us to think about the older brother for just a minute. While the prodigal son was off squandering his inheritance and uh, living a wild lifestyle, the elder brother attempted to fellowship with his father at the top rung of, the, of performance, the top rung of the ladder. He said, all these years I've served you and I've, there's nothing that you've asked me to do that I have not obeyed. So he, he sought to meet him at the top of the ladder, at the law, through obedience, through service. He faithfully went through, did all the stuff his father asked him to, and he was scandalized by, a, by his brother who met his father at the lowest rung of the ladder. Here's a, a guy who has done everything that was asked of him. Served, he obeyed, kept the rules, he did the right things. And his younger brother runs off and rides his living and then comes back and meets God, who is represented here by the Father, at the lowest rung of the ladder. And the result is the one who did all the right things, tried real hard, is out sulking and not inside enjoying the party. I don't think I ever thought about this that closely. But in the story of the prodigal son, the elder son refuses to join the party. He could have come to, could have said, well, that's great that my brother's back and my father is giving him a party and let me get in on the party. Let me, I, I'll, I can set free from striving, doing all this stuff. I can, meet, I can meet my father at the lowest level, but he doesn't. He's scandalized not only by his brother's outrageous behavior and moral bankruptcy, but he's scandalized even more by his father's extravagant grace. How could you let him do that and you just receive him back like nothing happened? And he said, well, something did happen. Your, son who, your brother who was dead is, is alive. He is a, a different person. And the prodigal son found grace and joy and forgiveness at the lowest rung, the rung of grace. But the older, older brother just... Kept, apparently after the story, just kept trying harder, seeking to be justified by the law and to keeping the rules. And I imagine he probably tried even harder. He said, well, I'll prove to my father that I'm even, I, can, I can 
be even better and try serve harder, serve better. Many people are like the elder brother who would rather hold on to the law and the rules, even though they, the rules just keep proliferating and, and it's like being on a treadmill, it's going faster and faster. Our answer to that is to go faster um, and, they, and keep going faster and keep doing more things, striving harder. And I've often said this, the job of religion is to teach you how to perform to um, get God to love you more, to favor you, to bless you. And so grace puts religion out of business. And it's all about our ability to bargain with God. That is an issue. The person who thinks they have all these chips, these bargaining chips with God, they have all these, this, um, these works and deeds and things they've done that somehow gives them, obligates God to them. And then Jesus comes along, turns this whole paradigm upside down and says, all of your bargaining chips don't mean anything. They don't get you to where you want to be in God. So why do people hold on to the rules and the law rather than accept the free gift of God's grace. I just want to mention a couple of these. One is the law offers a safe, secure, and predictable religion. It promises to keep the rules. As long as we keep the rules, then your religion will be a safe, predictable one and will serve a safe, predictable God. Brennan Manning said this way, what makes legalism so attractive is that it meets a basic human need, security. We create a very solid foundation for our lives because God can never surprise us. We know that we have what we have put into him so we know what, exactly what to expect from him. And we, when we live by the, the rules and the laws, now there's nothing wrong with laws per se, I'm talking about laws and rules that, uh, to reach up to God, to try to earn God's favor, his blessing, his goodness, his salvation, and so on. When, as long as we maintain this environment of rules as the basis of what we're trusting in, then we don't have the awesome responsibility of needing to hear from God for ourselves. Just give me the rules. What should I do? And uh, so we don't have to be. We don't have to be led by the Spirit. We don't have to discern right and wrong. We don't have to think for ourselves. We don't have to search the Scriptures. We can say, like the Israelites said to Moses at Mount Sinai, "Speak to us yourself, and we will listen. Only let let not God speak to us, lest we die." They said. Moses, and they see the thunder and the lightning and the earthquakes and the smoke and fire. He said, um, <laughs> Moses, why don't you go up, get the rules, get the law, and you come down and give us the law, and we'll keep the rules. Rather than go up uh, to meet God themselves. I mentioned that one of the things that, that religion does is it substitutes a list of rules for a relationship with God. It would be a lot easier to just have a list of rules. If you were in your marriage, if you started off your marriage, you just had a list, each had a list of rules. That would be a lot easier than... Um, working through relationships. Uh, relationships are messy things. And so it would be, wouldn't it be nice if when a couple got married, we said, okay, here's your list of rules, and here's your list of rules. Uh, just follow the rules. 
Uh, we were, some of the men were talking the other night about what, about this very subject. What, what, what are the rules? Uh, what are the guys responsible for? What are the women responsible for? So we just said the guys will be responsible for it all. We'll just, uh, we'll take care of all the chores and, uh, and so on. But you, you could live like that and you could, you, your rules would keep multiplying because the, uh, the rule says take the garbage out. Well, it doesn't say when to take the garbage out. It doesn't say where to put it out. It doesn't say how often or well, all these other questions. So we have to make more rules. And uh, <laughs> you could just give me a list of rules and, and they would keep the rules. And it probably would function fine, but you would never come to a place called love. There would never be any love in that kind of relationship. There would just be rule keeping. And if you and punishments for not keeping the rules. So there's a, a freedom we have in Christ that can be real scary. Many people prefer the rules to uh to seeking for God. We like a nice, safe, predictable God who stays in the boxes we put him in. Someone said this, one thing that God clearly revealed to us in Jesus Christ is that God doesn't stick to his job description. <clears throat> he turns our ideas about God on their head. <clears throat> Jesus made it clear that we're, we serve an unpredictable God who doesn't conform to our expectations and understanding of how deity is supposed to behave. He can't be trusted to stay in the boxes, boxes that we carefully construct. <clears throat> Let me give you this great definition of faith that I just came across recently. Faith is naked trust in the too-good-to-be-true goodness of someone who can't be controlled. Faith is naked trust in the too good to be true goodness of someone you can't control. God will act in our life as we put our faith in him, but he's someone we can't control. We're constantly looking for ways to get God to do what we want him to do um, what's the formula for prayer to get God to do what we want him to do? What's the, what are the things we have to do that will get God to do what we want him to do? We're constantly looking for the formula. We're looking for the rules to keep, the methods to follow, and so on, because we want a predictable God. We all, secondly, we, we, keeping the rules gives us a certain bargaining power with God, or at least we think it does. Uh, it obligates God to us in a sense. We could say it this way, what is at stake is our ability to bargain with God, which is the fundamental motive of all religions. God gives the rules and we keep them and how well we keep them will determine our bargaining power with God. The law places certain obligations on us to be sure, but it also obligates God to us. If we obey the rules, then we earn a certain claim against God. And the thing about rules is to be justified before God we need to keep all the rules, all the time, perfectly and perpetually. But legalism will inevitably settle on a certain group of rules, certain types of rules and, um, and deeds that we, that we seek to justify ourselves by. For instance, let me, let me give you just a couple of these. For some, righteousness is measured primarily by what you don't do. 
How many of you know that type of uh, rule keeping? The, the rules are negative rules. They're what we, what we don't do. What, what not to eat, what not to drink, what not to wear, what not to do, um, where not to go. I call it righteousness by subtraction. It's you're righteous by what you don't do rather than what you do. Um, and then there's, you know, we can, as long as we don't do, there's a lot of things we can't do, but as long as we don't do them, then we can feel certain smug arrogance and moral superiority over those who do those things that we shouldn't be doing. And then there, for some, righteousness is measured by busyness and involvement in religious activity. Um, how many meetings you attend, how many programs you're involved in, how many committees you're on, how many people you witness to. And if you're really, the really spiritual Christian is a 24-7 Christian who's working like a devil for the Lord. <laughs> Busy as a bee for Jesus. He's working 24-7. And he goes, they go to every church meeting they're involved in 14 ministries. They're involved in seven committees. They witness to 10 people a week. And they feel morally superior if they don't have a, have a nervous breakdown first. So sometimes it's, we think it's, it's how busy we are doing the stuff, the stuff of God. For some, it's measured by doctrinal correctness and biblical knowledge. That's what makes you righteous and holy. How many times you've read the Bible? How many verses you can quote? Um, but probably most importantly is am I theologically and doctrinally correct? Um, it's not only am I Doctrinally correct. It's my job to make sure everybody else is doctrinally correct. And uh, so if I, if I read and study my Bible more than anybody else, I have all my biblical doctrines lined up. Um, and the nice thing about that is I can use biblical doctrines as fences to keep out those who don't fit into my, my category. They don't know we have... They don't believe exactly like us or do exactly what we do the way we do it, then we can sort of feel morally superior and just push them to the side. Or I'll give you one more. For some, righteousness is measured by my devotion to spiritual disciplines. Now, is there anything wrong with any of these? No, there's nothing wrong with spiritual disciplines or reading the, the word, or serving in ministries. It's, it's less we, we turn it into merit badges that make us somehow more acceptable to God. For some, it's devotion to spiritual disciplines. How long do I pray? How many chapters in the Bible do I read every day? How often do I fast? How much do I give? Do I get up every morning at 4 o'clock to pray? Do I read 14 chapters? Fast twice a week, give tithes, give to other organizations, and, and so on, on and on. Now, the problem, though, with the, with the law is that the law can point out the, the problem that we're sinners in need of forgiveness, but it cannot offer us the freedom of forgiveness. It can tell us that we need to be forgiven, but it cannot do it for us. It, needs, it, it can point out the need to live a righteous life, but it cannot enable us to live a righteous life. And it always points us back to ourselves as the answer. Try harder, do more, be a better person. No matter how hard we try, no matter how much we do, we never feel like we're really right with God. A little poem I often share with you, I've often shared with you, is do this and live, the law commands, but gives me neither feet nor hands, 
a better hope the gospel brings. It bids me fly and gives me wings. The old covenant, the law, can only say do this and live. And cursed is everyone who does not abide by all that's written in the law to do it. So the blessing is only if you do everything written in the, in the law per perfectly and perpetually. The purpose, the purpose of the law, which we're going to begin to look at next week, it is not to, it's not a means of salvation, it's the standard of salvation. The law is given to reveal man's sinfulness and total inability to deliver himself so that we would come to, we would stop our insane trying to climb the ladder to meet God with, under the law and come down to the first rung, the lowest rung, where God meets us in grace. Let me wrap this up by sharing this. And Larry, you'll like this. Um, it's from Isaiah 6. But I, I never thought to read Isaiah 5 before Isaiah 6. <laughs> so Isaiah just saw him back to open 6 and uh, start reading. So I read chapter 5, and I came across six woes. It says, woe to those who join house to house and add field to field. Woe to those who rise early in the morning to drink intoxicating drinks. Woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of vanity. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes. Woe to men mighty at drinking wine. Six woes. And then he comes into the temple in chapter 6. He says, I was in, in the year the King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And the seraphim were singing, were singing, holy, holy, holy. And he saw himself in the light of God's glory. He saw himself in God's light, the holy, in the holiness of God, and the brilliant radiance of his holiness. And in the, that light, he saw his own sin. He was pronouncing woes on everyone else until he came into the temple to the place of God's glory and holiness. And he saw himself, and he, he was undone. It's as if every joint in his body undid and it just collapsed. Uh, God, God forbid we should ever see our, our, ourselves and our sin in the light of God's glory. Then his, his word was, his response was, woe is me. Seven woes. The last woe, though, was the most important one, the woe is me, for I'm undone. And God, an angel, took a coal from the fire, from the brazen altar, which speaks of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And his sin was taken away. I want to close with this. James talks about the law as a mirror. And the law can show you, it can reveal yourself to you, but it can't change you. I look in the mirror and I say I need a shave. It reveals to me my need for a shave, but I can't use the mirror to shave. Um, actually, I probably could if I broke the mirror. <laughs> but how does God see us? We see ourselves in the mirror of God's law. 
and it clearly reveals to us every moral blemish, every stain of sin, every fault and flaw, every scar and wound, not only every outward imperfection, but every murderous thought, every evil desire, every twisted motive that lurks in the, in the dark places of our heart. And we, we see ourselves in the mirror, but God sees us from a heavenly perspective through a lens of grace. He sees not our sinfulness and our failings, but the glorious holiness of the Son of God. And it's kind of like a one-way, looking at yourself in a one-way mirror. And uh, sort of like our nursery, our cry room. You look at the mirror and you see yourself. Look at the law and you see yourself, and it's not a pretty picture. But the light, in the light of Christ's radiant glory, the light of his glory emerges, and we no longer see ourselves in it. We see the glory of God in that. We see Christ's radiant glory. We no longer see our sins, but only his glory. And the good news is God's grace tells us that he, that he will never again see our sins. God sees us through the lens of grace. And I didn't want to leave you in, in the law. I wanted to bring you to the place of God's glory, holiness, and in that light, uh, we, are, we see not ourselves, but we see Christ in whose glory we live. So maybe if, if, you've, if you've thought the way this works for Christians as well, <laughs> it's not just for salvation or whole Christian life, uh, we can get into this thing where we start striving, more laws, earn it, do more, keep the rules, try hard. And we come back to the lowest rung. That's where we meet Jesus. It's where we get, get grace to sustain us, to strengthen us, and to remind us of his favor and his blessing. Would you bow your heads with me? Before I pray, if there's anybody, is there anybody here you, you've said, you know, I think I've been striving and trying hard to earn God's favor, to get, to get from God his blessing, and, and here I've been trying to meet God at the law, trying to be good enough, trying to hard, try hard enough, and always felt like I came up short. That's because you came up short. And you realize today, so I, I need to meet God at the lowest rung of the ladder and, and receive his grace. So anybody would say, yeah, that's, that's me. I need, I need his grace. Thank you. Amen. Anybody else, just raise your hand and indicate that need. Amen. God wants to meet you this morning, not at the highest rung, but the lowest rung. He wants to come into your life, reveal his love, his glory, like the prodigal son. Don't be like the elder brother who st stood outside when the party was going on. There's a party for you if you are willing to meet him at the lowest rung. Anybody else? Amen. Amen. Okay, anybody else? Real quick. Amen. Simple message. We couldn't reach up to God, so he reached down to us. We're still struggling to try to get God to like us and love us and bless us. When God has that gift for us, we just have to receive it in faith. So let's pray together. Father, for those who raised their hands, or for those who just know that they need God and they've been trying to meet you on the top rung of the law, of earning it, of being good enough to qualify for it. But you've turned the whole 
picture upside down. And he said, no, it's everyone is invited. And they're invited at the lowest rung. They're invited to receive his life, his power, his favor, his, his goodness. I pray that you would give a party for each person, a spiritual party, for each person who cries out to you and wants to receive your life and your forgiveness. I pray that you would do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ed. Amen. How many of you are blessed by today's message? Yeah. Thank you.